are traveling through another dimension a dimension not only of sight and sound but of mind a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination that's the signpost up ahead your next stop the twilight zone whenever i have interviewed someone on the twilight zone podcast i've usually asked them a certain question or a variation on that question and the question is can the twilight zone exist without rod sailing we are at a time now where the, the twilight zone movie that has been in development hell for so long is sort of creeping closer to actually becoming a reality and it kind of got me to thinking in Rod Sailing's lifetime was this ever a possibility and what would he have done? I mean I've mentioned Planet of the Apes many many times as being what I consider to be the first Twilight Zone movie but what if he'd made an actual Twilight Zone movie? Just by chance I was flicking through some old Twilight Zone magazines. Now these things are a treasure trove of uh, facts and stories and interviews with uh, you know the likes of Richard Matheson and so on a lot of stuff in there and I just happened to come across an article called Notes for a Twilight Zone Movie it had a foreword by Carol Sailing and, uh, and she had this to say she said for years Rod planned to make a theatrical Twilight Zone he never had the time to put it all together but at one point he submitted the following proposal to some higher Hollywood power and Rod Serling's words were this movie will be a trilogy shot in black and white for a budget of under a million dollars the stories are separate and distinct but have a background thread that moves one into the other additionally to emphasize the connection to the popular TV series I would host this motion picture in much the same way as the TV series operated only two to three episodes are touched upon in this very brief resume. And then Carol Serling continues, The stories referred to here, an ex-Nazi on the run, and a blind woman played by Joan Crawford who finds sight for a few brief moments, turned up later as the pilot for Night Gallery. At some later date, Rod sent out another memo along with a story about an alien who lands on Earth and is hounded and hunted by adults and befriended by a child. Sound familiar? And there were more ideas, more stories filed under Twilight Zone the movie. One bears a fleeting resemblance to a segment now being shot as part of the Spielberg Landis film. Another tells the story of a little man who meets a warlock and the space travel, time travel and more. That one ended up as an Erwin Allen movie called The Time Travelers. So she goes on to say, included here are three of the others, accompanied by the following disclaimer from Rod. The following are the bare bones of a motion picture idea. There has been no attempt made to probe individual scenes and people. This is simply a skeletal approach to indicate a conception, a general direction and a basic theme. The writer visualizes this as an exercise in tension. The scenes here are broad stroked and perhaps just lie there making for a somewhat difficult reading, but they do contain innately exciting moments, excitement that would only show up in a screenplay. So after this defensive preface, the following is a very general and oversimplified storyline. So as Mr. Sailing says, what, uh, what you're about to hear are just simply notes, they're not complete stories, so we can't really, uh, we have to forgive them some of those gaps that are going to be there. I'm sure if he had been pursuing the project, he would have fleshed them out and so on. But uh, let's take a look at Rod Serling's proposed Twilight Zone the movie. Up in the September night hovered a silver white moon. Seymour Copperthwaite took brief note of it as he walked out of the New York Mets dugout and took a sauntering, strolling, devil-may-care walk towards home plate. He carried one bat. Other men, lesser men, swung two or three bats. Other men, lesser men, fiddled with their trouser belts, kicked off mug cleats, furiously rubbed rows and bags to dry their hands. But not Seymour Copperthwaite. 
He needed none of the rituals, none of the idiotic liturgy that marked a normal baseball player's nerves and tensions. He was a man with a job to do, and the job was a home plate. He carried a single bat, the heaviest bat in the National League, to the private little area where the batter engaged in a moment of truth with the pitcher. He planted his two muscle-rippling legs into the dirt, the most muscular legs in the National League, and gazed out like a calm eagle towards the pitcher's mound. A smile played on his lips. Then he let his eyes scan the outfield. He had the best eyesight in the National League. And then he thought to himself, Los Angeles Dodgers, big deal. Look at Schofield on third. Plays much too close to the bag. Leaves a space you could drive a locomotive through. I might pull to the left and get it right past him. Or look at Willie Davis way out on the track. He knows I have power. He's scared to death. I could just dump it over second. Or park at a first, playing way the hell back. A bunt along first, drag it. That would squeeze one over and we would take it here in the ninth. When you get 150000 a year salary, you have to do the unexpected. Ruth could strike out on occasion. DiMaggio could even pull a rock and ground into the double play. But that's not what they expect to see more Copperthwaite. Seymour Copperthwaite leading the league in home runs, runs battered in, batting average, and everything else. No, sir. I see more Copperthwaite will do the unexpected. I will fake a bunt, and on the next pitch, I'll belt it, I'll hammer it, I'll show him. A long ball that'll break it up and send the Dodgers back to the smog with their tails between their legs. I, Seymour Copperthwaite, the Adonis, a machine of muscle and sinew, perfect in its coordination, its power, its capacity to outthink and outplay any other team or any other man in any other team. Seymour Copperthwaite of the New York Mets, ready to bring a National League pennant back to the boroughs for the first time in 11 years. The shining platinum moon stared down from its sky perch on Shea Stadium and on the figure of Seymour Copperthwaite standing at home plate. There was a stillness throughout the vast, multi-tiered arena. The only sound was of an errant wind, a distant aircraft landing at LaGuardia, and the sound of Seymour Copperthwaite's breathing. The New York Mets were playing at St. Louis that night, and Los Angeles Dodgers had an off day, and were out on the West Coast. There was no one in Chase Stadium, except Seymour Copperthwaite. Other men... Lesser men were a home at hearth, but Seymour Copperthwaite, a 15-year veteran in the hot dog concession, was no dreamless suburbanite. He had verve and imagination, and on the nights that his beloved Mets were out of town, he would rise to his full five foot six, hitch up his little pot belly, and make believe he was winning a pennant for the club. He would wander across the outfield, making shoestring catches of imaginary fly balls, or fling himself against the centre field fence robbing the Dodgers of the home run, or the Cardinals of a triple, or ending the game spectacularly, snaring one of Willie May's phantom screams of the phantom crowd calling his name. And then he had walked to home plate, tip his cap to the invisible rates who screamed his name, and belt one out for God, country, the city of New York, and the Mets. He was not Seymour Copperthwaite, a bandy-legged, pot-bellied, 46-year-old schlep. He was Copperthwaite of the Mets. He was the man among men, an Adonis, that's what he was. The crowds chanted his name, and Copperthwaite tipped his cap. Copperthwaite, schmuck, how many times have I got to tell you that you ain't allowed in here when the team's not playing? How many times, schmuck? You want I should run you in now, or will you go home already? The voice was that of Bull Walsh, one of the stadium guards who wore a badge and had no imagination. He shined his flashlight through the wire mesh of the screen behind home plate, watching Copperthwaite just before he pointed to the left field to announce to the screaming mob that's where he would park the pitch, a la George Herman Ruth. You hear me, schmuck? Off the field. I mean right now. Off the field. The grandeur dissolved. The crowd noises were cut off. The cheering throng disappeared and became 48,000 empty seats. The billion-powered incandescent lights over the field went black, and there was only the moon and Seymour Copperthwaite. Sparse shoulders slumped as he turned disconsolately to face the dream killer with the badge. Shedding his batting average, 
the eagle eyes, and his thoughtful and brave smile to become once again of the hot dog men on an off night. The Brockman Mansion is the last of its kind, a dark, cheerless, 20-room brownstone on Beacon Street. It's an unkempt museum of uncomfortable, straight-backed chairs and overstuffed sofas. Its panelled walls lustreless as if polished by darkness, reflecting the sombre shadows of the house itself. And as for the Brockman clan, there's Diane Brockman, Selina's niece, in her mid-twenties, a long-legged miniscare and bitch in heat, who undulates rather than walks, as if keeping time to some perpetual music, wiggling invitationally to an unseen audience. Her mother, Selina's sister, is a leathery-faced crone, vegetates in a chair, staring out at the street. Does she think? Does she contemplate? The vacant eyes and the silent mouth offer no clues, only an occasional blink and twitch, to verify the fact that she still lives, just a window pane away from the world outside. The Zorville, a combination handyman and resident village idiot, who tends the fairness and empties the rat traps. His origin's uncertain. All that's known is that he was an orphan boy picked up by Selina thirty years before, in a spasm of the same kind of compassion that allowed Chinese immigrants to come over as cooks for lumber camps, and the Selina herself, the grand dame of the menagerie, who lies in her four-poster in an inch-by-inch inch battle with death, trying somehow to reach a compromise instead of capitulation. But each morning, more and more hard-pressed to eke strength out of the frail, wasting 75-year-old body, the used-up lungs, the once regal, impervious spirit, that now betrays her as she gradually slips away. A young internist, Dr. Dieter, makes sporadic visits to the house. House calls on his thing, and the Brockmans aren't his kind of people, but a doctor father and a doctor grandfather, both of whom tended to this group, carry the obligation across the dynasty. So he arrives periodically with black bag, stethoscope, pressure taker, and thermometer, to go through the hopeless motions. He writes out the prescriptions to ease a little of the pain, but little else. And as always, he takes huge, deep gulps of fresh air whenever he leaves the house, because there's something about the place and its people that beckons to something worse than death. In a small Ohio town is the last known living relative of the Brockmans. Her name's Deborah. She's 20 years old and a registered nurse. She receives a long-distance phone call from Cousin Diane announcing the impending death of Aunt Selina. And the conversation is lightly spattered with suggestions of legacies contingent on loyalties. Debbie Brockman, orphaned since her early teens, is a bright, lovely, very normal young woman there's nothing of the teenage virgin about her, or the insulated ingenuousness of a Noviet nun. But her life has been spent within walking distance of a village drugstore, and there's something fresh, new and challenging about visiting the fabled relatives spoken of throughout her lifetime in the whispered cadence used to describe other kinds of people. So Debbie goes to New York and is welcomed into the Brockman mansion almost as a prodigal returned. It takes her about a few hours to feel the same distance for the place and the people that Dr. Dieter, during an early acquaintance walk, shares with her. In the steel, ball-bearing eyes of Selina Brockman is an unholy clutching of life that transcends either science or faith. In Diane, there is a quality of uncommon lust, lust that transcends the flesh and turns unspokenly inwards towards something far more morbid and far less earthly. 
And as to the vacant Martha, Diane's mother, who sits at her accustomed place by the window, looking out, unseeing at traffic and people far more flesh and blood than she, even this woman carries with her her own special enigma. It begins with something as small and apparently insignificant as a liver spot, a tiny brown circular discoloration on the back of one of Deborah's hands. She mentions it in passing to Dr. Dieter, and it would probably have gone both unnoticed and even unchecked had it not been simply the opening gambit to an appalling, nightmarish game that defies logic, reality, and even sanity. Because gradually, moment by moment, Selina begins to take on strength. The heartbeat is firmer and more regular, the chest pains less convulsive and frequent, the pulse stronger and steadier. But as Selina grows stronger, incredibly, inexplicably, something begins to happen to Deborah. It is her heart that begins to skip beats, her chest that begins to emit pain, her once firm, strong, young hands that take on the palsied, quaking quality of an old woman. First there are just symptomatic suggestions, but gradually, very gradually, the, the changes become physically perceptible. We're watching a hellish exchange taking place between a dying ancient harridan and a young woman. Some witch's contract, defiant of root or reason, but happening with a deadly certainty. Dieter admits Deborah into a hospital for a series of tests. They run the gamut of almost every known scientific device that could conceivably explain the premature aging process, which is visibly turning a young woman into a dying old one. Dieter goes to the Brockman house and examines Selina Brockman, who now sits up in bed, bright-eyed, clear-coloured, drawing on some new hidden strength and energy, that defies any kind of logic or precedent. When Dita inferentially suggests the relationship, or at least the coincidence of Selina's recovery with Deborah's incredible diminishment, the conversation is shunted off both by Selina and the never present Diane. Ultimately, it's Orville, the semi demented handyman, who provides the first in a series of chilling clues. Orville is a great picture looker. He loves running grimy fingers over illustrations, pointing out eyes, noses and limbs. Without Diane's knowledge, he takes out an old photograph book, and Dieter is shown a picture of Diane's mother, the now vapoured Martha, whose world is a static catbird seat outside of a window. Underneath the photograph is a caption annotating its date and circumstances. It had been taken on a school picnic some 50 years before, and there had been an accident with a runaway horse, a wagon, and ultimately a kerosene lantern that had exploded. In the photograph, Martha wears a bandage around her left arm, covering the vestiges of a burn scar. It's later, when Dita is talking to Diane, that he suddenly realises that on the left arm of Diane Brockman is the thin, red remnant of aged scar tissue. The evidence is presumptive, but gradually takes on a form throughout the story. The Brockman mansion, the looming dark, ugly place, so full of shadows and enigmas, possesses an evil that could never have been guessed at. Martha, who rocks her life away like a shallowly breathing statue, is in reality her own daughter, Diane. In this witch's coven, the name of the game is longevity, and the rules of the game defy any sense of morality or love. When illness, age and death encroach, this is when the ancient art of trade takes place. Dita, torn apart, both by the horror of the discovery and the potential horror of its ramifications, tries to force Selina to explain the secret and give Deborah back her own birthright. Violently, Diane tries to intercede, and in the process it's Orville, stumbling, bumbling, block-headed, dim-witted Orville, who becomes the prime mover. He inadvertently begins a fire, 
which starts to lap away at the ancient structure. In the hospital, Deborah awakens from a drug-induced sleep to discover that her faculties are beginning to retain vision, heart, stability. As the evil is burned away in the old Brockman place, its results turn into ashes as well. Deaton and Deborah survey the charred remnants of the ancient mansion. Police and firemen are still looking through the remains. Bodies are brought out. Orville's is unmistakable. Selina, by virtue of her bedclothes and the location of the body, is also identified. And poor old vacant Martha, who else would be far near the window? Diane's body is missing. An onlooker saw one screaming woman leave the house. Her clothes are fire. The woman had disappeared. It's much later, many weeks later, that in a faraway hospital in a distant city, an indigent old woman, suffering massive burns across body and face, is being treated in a charity ward. Little hope is held out for her survival. But simple humanity and compassion dictate at least the effort. But an odd thing. One of the young nurses attending her is beginning to suffer from what can only be described as burned scar tissue on the lower half of one of her legs. And oddly enough, so very oddly, the old woman in the bed is showing just the slightest improvement on one of her legs. This is the story of a woman. It begins quietly and with little sense of apprehension with a white-collar secretary winding up a typical day. There's little to suggest, as she covers her typewriter, takes a few last-minute notes from her boss, eludes a kind of half-hearted pinch that anything out of the ordinary will occur. As a matter of fact, it's essential that the normality of the girl and her life is emphasised by way of contrast to what will occur. She and her girlfriend decide to stop at a bar en route home. While they're there, they're accosted by a couple of ugly drunks. The scene, first difficult, becomes violent, and a brawl ensues. Our girl is shaken by the event and decides to go to the movies, leaving her girlfriend at the subway stop. She enters the theatre alone and sits down, and initially her reason d'etre is to to settle down from the emotional inroads made by the bar episode. She welcomes the darkness and her aloneness. What's going on on the screen has no real meaning to her until a familiar sound hits her ears. It's the voice of her boss, loud and distorted. She looks up on the screen and there, much bigger than life, inexplicably and somehow nightmarish, is herself playing her goodbye scene that took place just a few hours ago in the office. There she is on the screen with her employer. The dialogue is identical. The incident's identical. Everything played just as it happened. She lets out a gasp and now watches with a kind of fatal fascination as this movie unfolds. We watch the screen with her and we see her leave the office building just as it actually happened. We see her meet her girlfriend and then go into the bar and we see the violence in the bar reenacted. When it reaches its zenith, the girl can stand no more. She rises in the near empty theatre and rushes towards the rear. An usher and finally an assistant manager try and calm her down as she desperately tries with disconnected phrasing, almost gibberish, to explain the phenomenon. They obviously figure she's some kind of nut, try to calm her down and get her to leave. She insists that they go back into the theatre with her so that she can prove what's going on. That, on the screen in some incredible way, they're playing a movie of her life. 
They go back into the darkened theatre and there on the screen is a cartoon. Both the usher and the assistant manager exchange a wise knowing look and get a policeman to escort her home. Late at night in her apartment she ponders what she now believes to have been an illusion brought on by the drinking and the emotional scene in the bar. But so shattering has been the illusion that she calls up a young man who works in the office and tries to relate to him on the telephone what has happened. He's disturbed by the near frenzy in her voice and suggests that they have a drink together after work the next day. And the next day comes, a, a rather tense, apprehensive day, because the girl cannot shake, nor can she explain what she now knows actually did occur. After work, she and the young man have a drink, and she recounts the entire story just as it happened. This is not an unimaginative guy, but he is somewhat pragmatic. He tries to explain to her, in pragmatic terms, what very likely occurred. The combination of the violent moment, along with a couple of stiff cocktails, provided a kind of traumatic basis for an illusion. Also, she was probably tired to begin with. She, she accepts this, or at least allows it to end the conversation. She excuses herself and turns down his offer to be escorted home. She starts to walk towards the subway station and is probably only subconsciously aware of the fact that she deliberately goes out of her way to arrive on the same street as the theatre. She finds herself out in front, compulsively, and with a burgeoning fear and apprehension, she buys a ticket, walks inside, pauses by the doors leading from the lobby to the theatre itself then forces herself to enter the darkened arena. On the screen is the tail end of a newsreel, and as she sits down there is an obvious wave of relief. The screen goes dark, just for a brief moment, and then we're looking at the bar, with our girl sitting with the young man. She stifles a scream as she witnesses a replaying of the past two hours. Exactly as they happened, his dialogue and hers. The place, the time, the event, all identical, just as they happened. She bolts from her seat and starts up the aisle, but something, something almost extrasensory forces her to turn before leaving the darkened theatre to look back once again toward the screen. There on the screen is the city street outside, a jeweller's window next door to the theatre with a clock in it reads 8.30pm. Then, on the screen, she sees herself leaving the theatre, stopping to stare at the clock in the window, and suddenly the glass shatters, concurrent with an explosive gunshot. She whirls around and screams as we abruptly cut to her own scream, standing there at the rear of the theatre. In run the usher and with him the assistant manager, they're, they're torn between their concern and also no little impatience that of all the theatres in that town, this nut had to pick theirs, because concurrent with their reaching here on the screen are the opening credits of a big Hollywood movie, terribly normal, terribly matter of fact. They take her to the office, try to calm her down, and ultimately send her home. She goes out into the street, and her attention is immediately captured by the jewellery store window. She moves over to it and stares at the clock inside the window. It reads 8.30pm. Suddenly the glass shatters. She wails around, screaming. We see a guy running down the street, chased by another man, firing a pistol and screaming something about, You can't break up my family. A police car screams into the scene while the girl runs down the street as if trying to escape a nightmare. In her apartment, our girl is being attended by a doctor while her young man waits nervously in the living room. The doctor gives her a sedative and talks soothingly of the very common after effects of overwork and subconscious tensions. He talks somewhat obliquely of psychiatric help 
then walks out into the living room, tells the young man that she'll be going to sleep soon, and there's no need to wait. Early in the morning, the girl awakes. She tosses and turns fitfully, then compulsively rises and dresses. Minutes later, she's back at the movie house. It's a round-the-clock theatre, and again she forces herself against both will and judgment to buy a ticket and re-enter the theatre. She takes a seat in the sparsely peopled interior, and with some kind of sick fascination forces herself to look up at the screen. On it is playing her recent examination by the doctor in her own apartment, and again the same dialogue, the same everything. By the middle of the scene she's close to shattering, she leans across to a big slob chewing away at popcorn and asks him what it is that he's looking at on the screen. The big clod is angry and impatient and tells her to leave him alone. What the hell does she think he's looking at? Her own voice rises nervously and shrilly and others in the theatre start to shout for her to keep quiet. She forces herself into the silence and again stares at the screen where we see her image inside the theatre replaying the scene with the popcorn eating clods just as it had occurred moments before. As this movie unfolds, she sees herself leaving a seat and heading up the aisle, entering the lobby, then rushing hurriedly into the street, running down the empty city streets, almost getting hit by a taxi as she goes against the light. Finally, she arrives at a subway station, stumbles, almost falls, races down the steps, frantically fishes for a coin to go through the turnstile, then onto the platform. After a moment's wait, she hears the sound of the approaching subway train. She's bathed in sweat, obviously suffering a prior knowledge of what she's about to do. As the train approaches, she forces herself to move back away from the platform's edge, whirls around so that her back is to the tracks, and in this moment, we see what she sees. A clock, advertising posters, a blind man with a dog, a couple necking on a bench, a man sleeping with a newspaper over his face, the tabloid carrying the date, March 20th, 1965. The subway train sounds louder, she turns, and just as the train lights flash down the track ahead, she takes one nightmarish run to the ledge and flings herself in front of the train, her scream like some incredible siren. Abruptly we cut back to her in the theatre in the aftermath of what she's seen. She jumps up from her seat, rushes down the aisle, agonisingly conscious that she's doing precisely what's been ordained. We follow her down the deserted streets, exactly as we've seen it happen on the screen. We see her almost being hit by a taxi and then stumbling down the steps of the subway station. We see her move onto the platform of the subway and then back away. But at this moment, she departs from the pattern. Seeing a telephone booth, she races towards it, hurriedly dials a number. The young man picks up the phone at the other end. She's close to collapse as she tries to explain to him where she is. Please come and help me, save me from something, God knows what. He does come and save her. He takes her back to her apartment. He tries to reason with her, calm her. As she tells him the story and recounts everything she's seen on the screen in such incredible detail, even down to the last moment when she was waiting for the subway train. She even describes the posters, the blind man and his dog, the couple necking, even the man sleeping with the newspaper over his face with the March 20th dateline. He puts her to bed and then, satisfied that she's sleeping, maintains a vigil through the early morning checks here once to see that she is sleeping, then leaves. The next day at the office, he notes that she does not arrive at work, and then telephones the doctor to ask that he checks her sometime during the day. Then he phones her to make sure she's all right. She answers the phone in her apartment, and though nervous and tense, she is able to speak rationally. He tries to point out to her that whatever the chain of the illusion, she's been able to break it. She did go to the subway, but at that point, instead of suicide, she phoned him for survival. He puts down the phone and looks disquieted. Something bugs him. He 
He can't articulate. He can't put his finger on it. But the disquiet persists all during the day. It builds and becomes somehow frightening that night when he's eating his dinner alone. He phones the doctor, who tells him that the patient is fine. Nervous, but over the hump. He's given her an additional sedative, and she should be sleeping. The young man decides to take a walk. He finds himself in front of the movie house and, in the process, looks at a newspaper stand. And then it hits him. The story she recounted as having taken place in the subway contained reference to a newspaper spread over a sleeping man's face. And she had mentioned seeing the date of March 20th, that is tonight's paper. Incredibly, unbelievably, it must be that the scene she enacted is yet to take place. He races towards the subway station, down the steps, but halfway down, he hears a scream, and on the platform, he sees a young couple, a blind man and his dog, and the ageing drunk, who has obviously just gotten up from a nap, all staring with horror toward the subway train which has stopped, but it's already done its killing. He walks away, trance-like, numbed by horror, and strangely, compulsively, unexplainably, he goes to the movie house, buys a ticket, and goes in. He looks up at the screen and sees himself entering the movie theatre. He wants to scream. He opens his mouth. So there we have it, the Twilight Zone movie that could have been. But like the article says, there were many stories that were proposed. These are just three, and uh, unfortunately Rod Sailing never quite got to make that. But interestingly, that last story was actually adapted into a television special called, uh, I think it was something along the lines of Rod Sailing's Lost Classics, The Twilight Zone. It had... James L. Jones as the narrator and uh, there were two stories in it we may talk about it one day, we'll see but um, not a completely successful adaption I don't think, you know, perhaps if Sailing had finished it himself he would have smoothed out any sort of inconsistencies and beefed up the story and the characters and so on, as it was you know, the next best person to do that actually did the adaptation and that was Richard Matheson, but it doesn't quite work. But I need to maybe go back to that and just check it out again. It's been a while, but it's an interesting kind of experiment, I suppose. And it's very in keeping with this question, you know, can the Twilight Zone exist without Rod Sailing? We've all got our own thoughts on that. My friends, it has been a while. I must admit, after the last episode where I uh, was lucky enough to speak to Anne Sailing just reflecting on that for a moment what a wonderful opportunity and what a wonderful woman um, I count myself as extremely lucky to have been able to do that she is such a you know such a sweet person and you know a real great ambassador for her father's work um, I really suggest you check out her book as I knew him my dad Rod Sailing it's it's a beautiful beautiful read I, you know I do hope to cover it in some fashion. I was going to write a review, which I probably still will. Um, it's just time's been on a premium of late. But I really recommend it. You know, it's uh, it's more than just her own memories. There's, uh, there's letters that Rod Sailing wrote when he went to war. Just really fascinating stuff. But yeah, a, a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful woman. And, you know, I, I do count myself as very lucky. And after that... The time just didn't seem to be there to do this podcast, and I must admit, I got to the point where I, and I did think to myself, is there really any point in carrying on the podcast, you know, considering the episodes are so fragmented now. So, why am I sitting here behind this microphone now talking to you? Well, 
a couple of things kind of uh, transpired to, to get me back here. Um, you know, like I say, I was thinking, what's the point? There are another couple of Twilight Zone podcasts that have cropped up since I've been doing this. And I, I don't, you know, I don't bear that any ill will. I think, you know, great, whatever keeps people talking about the show is fantastic. You know, I don't own the Twilight Zone, so anyone has the right to do a podcast. Um, so, you know, fair play to them and good luck to them. It was more kind of like, well, other well, people are doing it now. Maybe I should just sit back and let them do it. A friend of mine, Kate, you know, spoke to me about it and she said... You know, you can't let go of things that you, you love to do because, you know, you're really just closing down a part of yourself and you need to sort of have this creative outlet kind of thing or else, what else is there? You know, you just become kind of bereft of any sort of passion and, and creativity. So, you know, I, I mulled that over. But then today I got a message from my good friend Brandy Jacola. You may remember her, I think she read possibly Brothers Beyond the Void on the podcast. She has this beautiful speaking voice, just just absolutely gorgeous, and she's a, a beautiful person. But she said in this message, she said, My dear Tom, uh, Friday night at Salt Lake City Comic Con, I got to meet Anne Sailing. I told her that we heard her on your podcast and that we're friends, and she said to tell you hello. And she also said you're a true gem her exact words, and that she so much enjoyed being interviewed by you. Brandy says another few things I won't go into, because it's, it's a lovely and quite personal message. Um, but she bought Anne Sailing's book and got it signed, and she says it's now one of her most prized possessions, but she wanted to pass that on to me. She says, I just wanted you to know that she regards you very highly and loves what you've done with your podcast. And it was reading that, that ultimately was a thing for me to say, you know what, even if it is every few months, or I, I want to carry on doing this because I do love the Twilight Zone, and every time I immerse myself in it, it's I learn something new, and I'm refreshed by you know, its message, what Rod Serling wanted to put out to the world. It is such a quality thing in that way. So I really, you know, I have to say thank you to Kate and thank you to Brandy, without whom, you know, there's a very real possibility might, I might have said, you know what, let's uh, let's call it a day. But here I am, I hope uh, you're still out there listening. The listening figures are, are really quite good, considering I, I, you know, I hardly ever put out a podcast, so that, you know, at least people still are out there and downloading the show, so that's great. But thank you to Kate and thank you to Brandy, uh, especially for that, that beautiful message. And I do hope we get her back on here again with that gorgeous voice of hers reading uh, reading as a story, maybe. But I'll clear the decks of uh, a bit of housekeeping before I go. A few thank yous and a bit of, uh, a bit of feedback for some, uh, some episodes that have been put out. We've got uh, an email here from Philip. He said, Hi, Tom. Just wanted to chime in with some feedback about execution. Since picking up the Blu-rays of The Twilight Zone, I felt that Joe Caswell's plight at being pulled out of his time was best exemplified not in speech about justice with Mannion, but in his trying to make sense of the world of the 1960s. I think, and this is just my opinion, that the moral of the story is that the evil men do follows them and eventually gets them in the end. Caswell's evil killing of all those men gets him in the hands of the thief. Mannion's evil, however altruistic, of playing God sees him dying at the hands of his creation, while the thief's evil sees him getting the justice that Caswell escaped. For me, the episode plays out like a tragedy rather than a violent crime and re retribution piece. In regards to your concerns about the format of the show, I feel that there were no trivia that where no trivia exists, you should be allowed to wing it if you have to. Loving the show and the website as well. Thanks, Philip. Appreciate it. Then I had uh, an email from a friend of the show, Andrew, in New Zealand. Now, he's uh, sent me a lot of facts and figures about the Twilight Zone pinball machine. Um, because we're running quite long, I'm going to leave that one to the next episode, but I just wanted to say thank you to Andrew for that. Um, we'll read it out because it's quite an interesting thing, and you can actually 
get a digital version of that game now on your iPad or you know tablet device so it's uh, it's also quite a current thing so we'll talk about that next time as always thank you to the people who leave feedback on iTunes uh, we've got in the US Trick Black uh, Scion13 uh, good to hear from you Will and I hope George is doing well Bryce Rabbits Susanica uh, Susanica's fee- uh, feedback was Really nice. She said, Tom gives thoughtful analysis in his podcasts, but manages to avoid becoming inaccessibly academic. And I'm glad you've picked up on that because that's entirely the point of it. I want this to be for everyone as the show is. So uh, well played, Susanica. Thank you for that. And then we've got JC1993. So thank you. I think there might be more since then, but I'll read them out in the next one. In Canada, we've got I am Funkenstein aka Martin uh, and he's another one of those kids who like me stayed up late waiting for new episodes of the Twilight Zone so thanks for that and Physico thank you guys and then a couple of UK ones Frisbee Honest and Phil Tunes thanks for your feedback guys as well okay well I will leave it there for now and hopefully speak to you in the not too distant future when we'll be talking about the big tall wish <laughs>